All righty, that is working. Evening, everybody. Hope everyone has had a pretty decent day, stayed dry for the most part, as difficult that, as that was. Um, so for tonight, uh, obviously kind of continuing on. So uh, tonight, the focus uh, for, this, for this chapter and this portion is on building relationships. Um, and honestly, it's one of my... One of my favorite things to talk about, personally, uh, is just because with my career field, a lot of my job, honestly, is relationship building. It's, it's relating to people. Uh, it's understanding them, kind of come to terms, uh, and sometimes compromising, compromising with them and just learning to kind of work together. You know, it's, it's a big part of everyday life uh, today is, is, is just kind of relationships, whether that's family, whether that's friends, or specifically what we focus on tonight uh, is as a church, you know, is the relationships that we build as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so to kind of get started on that, what is a relationship? We have like a full blown definition, but what common terms, what's a relationship? What's easy to describe for that? A friendship. A friendship. Absolutely. It's, it's generally speaking, just a connection, how two people or are connected together. And so if you go to Webster, if you don't get very official with it, relationship is described as the way in which two or more concepts, objects, or people are connected or the state of being connected. So on that note, what are some ways that we form or build relationships? Communications. Communications. Absolutely. Right. Talk from one another, get to know each other. Fellowship. Fellowship. Absolutely. Interacting with one another. Yeah, common interests, absolutely. So di different common interests. During the speaking, it's, it's always interaction with people. You know, we build relationships with our coworkers. We build relationships with fellow church members. We build relationships with people who have common interests as us. And so it all comes down to interaction, the way that we interact with each other and the way that we work together. So kind of on that note, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 20 through 22 through 48, there's an interesting point as far as kind of relationships and why they get important. So we won't read through that entire passage because it's a little bit lengthy, but basically long and short of it is, uh, Jesus is out one day, he's preaching, and there's a man who's possessed by a demon. And so Jesus goes to the man and he heals him of his possession, and there's a group of followers around there with him. And so his followers you know, are kind of gawking at this miracle that occurred, you know, removed the demon from this man. But amongst the followers, there's also some Pharisees, right? Some Pharisees and scribes. And you know, people are saying, oh my goodness, look at this miracle Jesus performed. And the Pharisees and the scribes try to stir up a little bit of strife. And they go, well, the reason that he can cast out that demon is because he worships the devil. So he's the devil. That's, that's how he got that done. Now, in a funny moment, because Jesus has a sense of humor, if you read through that passage, Jesus <laughs> kind of points them. It's, it's a long kind of swing of things, but he kind of points them in the right direction. He goes, first of all, if I were the devil and I were casting out demons... It'd be a pretty dumb idea to start, wouldn't it? Kind of puts them in check. But then the long and short that ends up happening is that Jesus basically tells them, you know, to quit the blaspheming. That, hey, you know what? You have your opinion. You have your thought processes. And you can have that, but it's going to be completely separate from me. And, of course, halfway through this discussion, the scribes and the Pharisees basically say, well, since you are the son of God, just perform a miracle. After he performs the miracle of getting the demon out of a man, they ask for another sign and he won't obliges them, basically says, hey, you can have your opinion, but it's not going to be a part of me. You know, allows them to kind of divide themselves. And so, though they try to claim that Jesus does by power of the devil, in response to the blasphemy attempted division, Jesus' sermon comes to a penultimate statement, verses 48 through 50. And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so he draws that line. And so at that point he says, the Pharisees are trying to claim that he's not who he says he is, and they're kind of working against him. And they say, well, who, who, how do you have proof of who follows you? And he goes, these people, the people who follow me, that come to me, they are mine. That is my relationship. Those are my people, and the others are cast aside. They're not a part of this. And so just as Christ called those that follow him his family, we are called to fortify our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ above all others. And so we're going to kind of start stepping on toes right there immediately because this relationship comes first. 
just as our relationship with God, relationship with Christ, is meant to be first in our lives, so is our interactions with each other. As believers and as Christians, these are things that are called to come first. And so, where do we start? So the term most frequently used in the Bible to refer to Christians is the word brother, Fine enough. Speaking of family and relationships, the term most frequently used is brother. The Bible also refers to God as our father and us as his children in numerous times, right? You can probably think of three or four different passages off the top of your head right now where this occurs. These terms point to the fact that as Christians, we are family and belong to the household of God. We'll turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. That passage says this. These things are right to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And so we belong to that household of God. That's who we belong to as believers. And since we are family in Christ, there is an exclusivity to that group, right? There's only one group of Christians. Correct and correct. No speaking, there's only one. So we're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 real quick. So we're reading verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So how are Christians described in this passage? Holy, right? Or holy, people of God, right? Special, right? Anointed. A lot of terminology that separates us. That's how we're described as believers. And we, and we are. We are we're separated from the world. That's, that's what the goal is, correct? The goal is... For us to mimic Christ to the point where people realize that and say, hey, they're different. There is something different about Dan. There's something different about Melissa. There's something different about Kenneth. There's something about them that separates them from, from everybody else and what all we experience. So as Christians, we're called to be different from those around us. And doing so allows others to see the difference Jesus has in our lives. We see this all the time, right, in everyday life. There's people who who claim to be Christians and they claim to be believers, but what's their lifestyle like? Doesn't show it, right? Pretty similar to the world. There's old, old saying, it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, flies like a duck, must be a duck, right? So the qualities that, that we have are what help us show other people that we are of Christ. And so the relationship we have with each other is granted through Christ. That's what connects us, right? Outside of my lovely family that is related to half the people in this room, not all of us are directly related, right? We're not directly related. So what binds all of us together? Christ, right? What binds all of us together is our faith and our baptism into Christ. That's what unites all of us. And so it is by the grace of God that we have been made alive in Christ and it is only by this bond that we can be counted as part of God's family. Right? The thing that connects all of us is our faith and our relationship in Christ. Now, we do have some hobbies and we have some things that we enjoy in common, but that's the main connector. That's the one thing that can't be severed from us. And so, though many people around us may bear a family resemblance by performing good deeds, being righteous, or even claiming fellowship with God... They've not truly submitted to him unless they do what he has told us to do. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Right, that passage says this. Ooh, that is, I almost read y'all the wrong one. That would have been embarrassing. All right, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? So again, getting to a point of contention, especially with the family resemblance, we're going to kind of break down into that a little bit. There are people 
who do good things that are not Christians. Agree or disagree? Agree, Agree, right? Because people do good things that are not Christian. There are people, and we're going to get ahead of ourselves a little bit, that claim Christ that are not Christians, right? Agree? So that's where, again, the relationship, all that comes through Christ. So in other words, there's nothing wrong with people being good people. That's awesome. There is nothing, well, okay, there's a lot wrong with people claiming Christ and not actually being Christian, so that is a problem. But there's nothing wrong with people doing good deeds and doing it just for the sake of being good, but just because they do that doesn't make them part of our family, right? There's, there's a distinction that comes from There's a purpose behind what we do. Matter of fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, we're going to turn over there real quick. Is this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So, what people will enter the kingdom of heaven? Those who do the will of God. So those who accept Christ, baptize in Christ, do the will of God will enter heaven. So, what does that mean? That means there's people who are part of a church, who sit in pews, right? Who read God's word, who participate in these things. But if they don't fully commit, if they do not accept Christ, repent their sins, be baptized into Christ, they're going to fall short. They can try, they can claim that they're part of the Mod Church of Christ or the Mod First Baptist Church, or they can claim God all they want to. But if they don't take that step of submission, if they don't fully commit all the way, same thing. They're not part of the family. They're not part of the family of God. And so, Sue, go ahead. Uh, you can turn over to Acts chapter 10. Come. And uh, read the first few verses there about a man who was a religious man, believing in God, but yet still there was something that had to go on. Acts chapter 10. Helps I give myself two hands here. All right. Where do you want me to cut off at? Because I'll go ahead and go for it. Are you read it off? No, I'm joking. Just the first couple of verses. Okay. So there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. He would tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. All right. So we're going to skip the journey. We're going to get, get to the destination. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they had asked him to stay a few days. Right there, prime example. Was Cornelius a bad fellow? No, he's a good guy. Did Cornelius not know anything about God? God for a man. He sent up prayers, sent up alms, gave offerings to God. But, just like this passage talks about here, he was short. God sent him to Simon, gave some division. He was baptized into Christ. Even though he did a lot of things right, even though he was a good man, even though he knew God and honored God, he hadn't gone all the way. He hadn't truly submitted all the way. And so, go ahead. Yep. Absolutely. We have salvation to all those who obey him. Again, that complete commitment, that complete submission. And actually, on true submission to Christ, 
means we access his grace in the way he commands, not in the way we see it. By faith, that leads to baptism. Look at Mark 16, 16. So through baptism, we are saved, we are connected to Christ, and we are given access to the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, baptism is not where our relationship with Christ ends, but it is the point where it begins, and there must be proper purpose behind it. I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 19 right here. Go and read verses 1 through 5. And it happened, while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the, to the people that they should believe on him, who had come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Same thing, is, is doing it for the proper purpose. So why had the people in Ephesus not received the Holy Spirit? They weren't baptized into Christ, right? The new God's word, again, kind of similar to Cornelius here, they knew the word of God, they'd even been baptized by John into John's baptism, but they hadn't been baptized into Christ. And because they hadn't been baptized in Christ, they're not shown this free spirit. They hadn't received the Holy Spirit. That's, it was kind of a funny line. The first time I read through that, I kind of chuckled a little bit. So he said, have you received the Holy Spirit? And then Paul, <laughs> they look at Paul and go, we haven't heard of the Holy Spirit. Like, what are you talking about? Right? And so they were missing that part. They had no idea. Happens, it can happen to people all the time. We can, we can do that to ourselves. Is people cannot realize what they're missing. When we put our spin and our opinion on it, we don't go to God's word, and we don't obey his commandments, but instead obey our own, we can lead ourselves astray. We can find ourselves missing something that we didn't know we were missing in the first place. Absolutely, and that still is it's for the remission of sin, being raised back into Christ. It's one of the things we have to literally die to our sins. That's one, two, one, that's one thing to me, very important. When you're teaching somebody the gospel, you have to just, I have to, you put my, not everybody else, my vote. I have to keep it in the fourth Boy, that's tough too, isn't it? It is. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I want them to, to do. I want to get baptized, but I want them to know why they're getting baptized. Mm -hmm. Not baptized because, you know, Dan says that's what I need to do. Yeah. It's, 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 it's important to know, to appreciate why you're getting baptized. Absolutely, and that's what makes all the difference. Per it's the intent. It's the purpose behind it. It's, the, it's doing it for the reason that God intended it. And that's, and tell you, that's a struggle. Obviously, I don't have any kids or anything yet, but obviously, as people who are raised in the church and have kids are being raised in the church, that's something we want to see happen. You know, we want to see these kids baptized in the cross. We want to see these kids receive the salvation. And we obviously want to tell them about God's word, but we don't want to just push them, push them, push them so that, okay, I'm getting baptized so that mom and dad are happy. Again, it's making sure, hey, they have, because I want to have eternity with Christ, because I want to give my life over to him and make that commitment, make that submission. And that's it. it's tough, because obviously we're not going to not minister our kids. It's ridiculous. But it's making sure that we, again, we understand we have the proper purpose and, and the reason behind it. And so the connection we share with our brothers and sisters in Christ is unique. Right? Obviously, we have chosen to submit ourselves to Christ, to give ourselves over to him, become part of that family. It's unlike any other fellowship in our lives, and because of that, must be prioritized. Because we are part of a unique group, because we're all connected into Christ, that's something we should prioritize. And we should prioritize being around each other. Uh, it's one of the great things to do is just opportunities of fellowship, is, is hanging out, is enjoying that time with each other, and then allowing each other to grow. And so on that note, 
So how do we grow these relationships? How do we build these? So even though we're all part of the family in Christ and grow together in the same knowledge of him, as believers, we sometimes apply the knowledge we have learned together and the standards we hold for ourselves differently. Rewind two weeks ago. Think, talk about building walls, right? Talk about once we set that line in the stand, sand, be prepared to defend it. Be prepared to defend that wall, but also on the, I won't say unfortunate side of things, but on the flip side of things, be prepared for somebody's wall to look different from yours. You know, to have, have a different point where they cut things off. And so the key in dealing with these differences is understanding the difference between a firmly held Bible-backed opinion and an actual edict or command from God. I mean, we, we all obviously have our opinions, right? And this goes outside of Scripture. We all have our opinions and our thoughts and our beliefs. Prime example, in my, uh, in my marriage, I'm going to call myself out. Uh, so when I was growing up, we were broke. Let's, let's put it that way. We were broke. One of the things we didn't have when I was growing up was a dishwasher. We had dishwashers. They were named Tim, Melissa, and Lane, funny enough. Right, it, was all, it was all manual labor. So when I got to about high school, moved to the house, had a dishwasher. Greatest day ever. Like, I'll take on dish duty now. It's just load that puppy up, make sure there's nothing drawn there. We're good to go. When Aaron and I got married, and I still get chewed out for this, by the way, Aaron likes to wash the dishes and then stick the dishes in the dishwasher. It, it blows it blows my mind. I love you though, babe. All right, blows my mind. She washes dishes and sticks them in the dishwasher when she's doing dishes. Now, if Tim gets to do dishes, I'll make sure there's nothing crusty and like anything will stick on there, but it's a dishwasher, right? It's kind of the job that it's, it's supposed to do. It's a different opinion. Now, at the end of the day, the dishes get washed, right? They're going to be done. We just have different steps we take to get there, right? Different ways that we think those things should be done. And so even on our end, we have that even as believers. You know, we have God's word. God's word is God's word, period. We have the same foundation, but the way that we apply that or the, some places where we stand can be a little bit different. For example, I know for a fact that immodesty is a sin. If you look at 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, but two godly people can agree on that statement that modesty is a sin, but disagree where that line is drawn, where it is for them. Um, for example, Pentecostals uh, believe genes are modest. That's just opinion. Say, hey, modesty is a sin. With that being said, you know, if, if you wear jeans, it's modest. Women need to be wearing skirts, right? I have a training client I have that's a Mennonite. And so, in his opinion, as part of their beliefs, uh, they don't mess with technology. They don't do radio, they don't do TV, things of that nature. Some of these things, this started off at one thing, that is God's word, right? Modesty is a sin. We all agree on that. That's an edict. That's a fact. That's a command. Where that branches off from there is a matter of opinion. Is, you know, we kind of get, we can get a little bit separated. What we have to make sure of in instances like this, because we're not always going to see eye to eye, is that we hold to biblical authority. We hold to the authority that is God word, God's word and not try to make our word more important than God's law. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. It says this, Hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. So again, of course, we kind of talked about this a little while back, but the same thing applies here in these buildings relationships, is when we come to points of conflict, when we grow with each other, because as you hang out with people, conflict's going to happen sometimes. We're going to have disagreeing opinions. We have to make sure that the authority stays focused on God. That what God's word says is what we bind ourselves to. Two, funny enough, the thing we are bound to in our relationship as a church family is Christ himself. And once you know the word that we need to rely on most in these instances is God's word. Is making sure that's the point that connects us and draws us back to us. So does this mean that we should never offer constructive criticism or advice to brothers and sisters in Christ? No, right? It's not what it means at all. It doesn't mean just because we disagree that we never interact, we never had those conversations. But instead, in what way should we go to our family in Christ if we do disagree with them? Love. In love, right? 
from the right place. You know, I've noticed, just kind of talking with people doing like interacting with people, is if you go into an argument with the mentality of, I'm trying to win an argument, right? One, nine times out of ten, nobody wins. If, if anything, the person on the opposite side stiffens on their opinion, you stiffen on yours, and then, hey, we both lost. Congratulations. If you go in trying to win, very little gets compromised. Very little gets settled. Things don't get fixed. But if you go into a conflict or an argument with a place of love, out of a point of, hey, I care about you. I care about what you're doing. I care about your opinion. A lot of the times, we're able to have resolution. Right? We're able to bring things back together. Even if you look at Paul and Peter, so I can't remember which book New Testament is, but Paul has to come to Peter and kind of get on to him a little bit because Peter, there's a church with the Jews and the Gentiles, and Peter is kind of neglected, interacting with the Gentiles. Right? He's preaching to the Gentile people, and the Jews came around, and Peter started being a little exclusive. He started hanging only with the Jewish crowd, neglecting the, those other brothers in Christ. And Paul had to get on him. It's like, hey, man, you're, you're killing your witness. You can't be talking to these Gentile people and preaching when they're hanging out with them. As soon as other Jews get around, told them to neglect that. Right? You're, you're hurting them. You're hurting yourself. It's the same place we come from. Not a point of trying to win an argument, but a point of love, of making sure we are taking care of each other. So I know we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. All right, we're going to be reading verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away with from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So look at that. So, what ways are we called to treat each other? Kindly, Kindly right? With love, tender hearted, forgiving. Always a tough one, right? The same way that God treats us. The same way that he approaches us so we are supposed to approach others. Absolutely, I see. It's, and because it's a responsibility as a more mature Christian to take care of younger Christian, take care of my newer in Christ. But I mean, we're people; we're stubborn. <laughs> you know, that happens. And so sometimes you got to relent. This actually getting the next point. Sometimes we got to let people learn, and that, and that's tough. But much like teaching a child a stove is not to touch a hot stove or allowing a child to fail a task, we must be careful and loving the way we approach our family in Christ in these differences. Give them freedom to learn. We've all been there, right? So for the longest, I had a, had a couple of burn marks on my fingers. It's one of those conversations. Hey, stove's hot. Don't touch it. Waddle off. Waddle back in. Go to reaching. Hey, stove's hot. Don't touch it. Well, finally hit the point where either somebody's not around or you go enough times. Sometimes you got to let people reach up and touch the hot stove. Sometimes you got to get your fingers burnt in order to learn a lesson. And so that's a tough point, but sometimes we have to let that happen. By doing this with love, though, not of a place of malice, but doing this with the right heart and with love, we also allow the opportunity for, the, for those people and Christians to not only learn, but then we leave the door open for us to learn from them as well. That's because if you approach somebody, let's say on a prime example, how many times have you had a negative argument, right, a bad conflict with somebody, don't come to resolution, things end poorly, and then you went back to them for advice? Doesn't happen, right? Typically, somebody rubs you the wrong way. You just don't broach the subject anymore. I'm not going to go. I'm going to find somebody else to go talk to about this. On the flip side of that, we all have friends, family members, people in the church that when we have conflict, when we're looking for advice, looking for opinion, we go back to those people because they do take care of us, because they do love us. And so that's the point is 
relationships. How do we grow these relationships? As we accept the fact that we're not always going to see eye to eye. eye. We accept the fact that there's going to be people who are more more mature in their walk with Christ. There's going to be people that are less mature. But at the end of the day, we approach them with a point of love. A point of taking care of them. Go ahead, Dan. With my kids growing up, Absolutely, and, that, and that's the only, it's, it's tough because we do. I mean, even as brothers and sisters, sometimes we bicker, sometimes we don't get along. And I'm sure, and I'm going to be honest, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me a slice. God goes, oh, man, like this again. Like this again. Of course, heck, there's millions of us. Millions of us. And I goes, oh, we're doing this again. It's a pain. I don't like it, but they'll get it figured out. If they come to me, they'll get it figured out. So absolutely. And so... Get to the finished product. So no matter what differences or similarities we have with our family in Christ, we are united in one thing, the edif- edification of Christ. We're united in coming to Christ and, and living for him and, and God being raised up. So if we commit to this purpose, then we will be able to coexist and grow together, even if that means not getting our way 100% of the time. Dan, like I said, just, just like with your kids, even though they didn't get along all the time, Right, even though there's there's times where they bicker, still together, right? Still family, still united. Same thing, same thing applies to us. Even though we're not going to see eye to eye every time, if we focus on the thing we have in common, thing that unites us, which is our relationship with Christ, we're going to stick together. So just as we we are called different parts of the body of Christ and called different roles in His church, so we must accept that despite our differences, we are tied together. <laughs> I'm sure there have been times, there's times where we love our family. We love family we're connected to. We love spending time with them. There are also times where our family can drive us just a little bit crazy, right? Can, can, can get on our nerves just, just a little bit, right? But despite those things, we're still a family. Same thing applies to us. We're united in Christ. We love each other. We're here to grow together. Sometimes we're going to get on each other's nerves. Sometimes we're going to disagree, but if we can keep our focus on that, then we're going to be able to grow those relationships and continue to grow each other. So by loving one another, uniting ourselves in Christ, we are able to grow in Christ. So we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. It says this, But speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So if we work together as different parts of the body of Christ, what are we able to do? We're able to grow. We're able to grow in our faith. We're able to grow the church. Right? We're able to bring people into that. We're able to grow in God. And so the relationships we build not only allow us to grow in Christ, but allow us to bring others to him as well. So kind of coming back to that first point is, is by setting ourselves apart, by accepting our relationships, by growing together, we are only not only to grow together, but other, able to bring other people to God as well. So on that note, favorite question world, questions, comments, concerns. Yes, ma'am.
absolutely. And I think I think that's definitely something that's a strong point of our church is spend a lot of time together. I mean, we really do. I mean, we do a lot of interact together, even not just here, but even outside of here. So absolutely. What else we got? Huh? I mean, I have to do a dish. I do it her way now if it makes y'all feel any better. But I lost. Sometimes we compromise, and so. Uh, yep. Because what? And here's what happened. Here's a great. Here's a great part on that. Because what happened is I had one of the times where I loaded it and didn't do it that way, and then something came out with stuff still on it, and then I lost. So I was like, ah, and there it is. All right. Huh? No, nah. nah, it's just made me do, do dishes again. <laughs> huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm still, nobody's right all the time except for God. No, the only one. That's, and that's still, it's, and that's, and it's tough. And, that's, and, that, and it's funny because, like, nobody enjoys being wrong, right? Everybody thinks they're right all the time. It's a bit arrogant. But we all at least have a point. We're able to admit like we're wrong. I, I used to be terrible about it. Like I, first, I used to be like growing up the worst person to like coach on because I'd get very defensive, and not not necessarily coach, but if I did something wrong, I'd be very defensive of why I'm wrong. And one of the best things I ever learned how to do is to take constructive criticism, is kind of work with that. And then it's it's just funny because you there's a big difference in the way that we treat people and interact with people who are willing to take criticism, and those who either refuse to admit that they're wrong or are going to be defensive of where they're at in the first place. Absolutely. Anything else? All right. I'm going to put myself on mute then.
Time for our devotional period. Just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, be sure to thaw out the chicken for Sunday and because uh, it's Fellowship Sunday. And so looking forward to that. Fellowship Sunday on Sunday coming. Uh, as far as our prayer list goes, Liz Melton did get to come home, I understand. And so that is great news. That's the only update I have for our prayer list. Um, looks like we had a birthday today. Chris had a birthday. He's the big 5-0. Well, no one, he's probably laying down tired, isn't he? <laughs> Uh, getting to be an old man. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow's Layton's birthday. All right, happy birthday to Layton. And looks like Saturday, old Clayton Estes. He's, what, 12 now, probably? Y'all don't know? You looked at one another? You don't? Okay, he's 12. There he is. He's back there with the other kids. Okay. Happy birthday to Clayton, as well as Charlie Wade has a birthday Saturday. And Chris and Brandy's going to have an anniversary Friday, looks like. Jason's going to lead our closing prayer tonight. David has our Devo filling in for Robbie, and we appreciate him doing that. And uh, Dan's going to lead our song after the devotional. It's 560 if you want to get your books. 560 in your song books. Let's all get our Bibles and study along with David. David? Good evening. Good evening. We're going to study tonight about abundant living. Prayer is the greatest power on earth. Matthew 6 and 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray in your Father, who is in secret, or place, or in secret place, and your Father, who is in sees in secret, and we will reward you openly. And let's look at eighteen, Luke eighteen and one. Then he spoke a parable unto the unto them, the men always ought to pray and look pray and not lose heart saying there was what there was a certain crime a judge who fear God regard men love God a gift love is a gift God-given flip privilege. Leviticus 19 and 8.
There, therefore, everyone who eats his shall bear the, his eternity because he has preferred the hollow offering of the Lord and the person who shall cut off from people. That was not the uh, none, none of you shall approach anyone who is near him and to one who is near him him to uncover the nakedness of I am the Lord, and the nakedness of the Father is the nakedness of your mother. And you shall uncover. She is your mother, and shall uncover her mark, the neck, her nakedness. <coughs> Read us the foundation of wisdom. Acts thirty, Acts eight and thirty. So Philip ran into him and heard, reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, Do you understand what you read what thou readest? In thirty one, and he said, How can I understand if someone unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him in the place the scripture which is read was this he was led into the sheep and slaughter and as a lamb before the share is is silent so he opened his mouth Anyway, he taught him the word, and he understood what he was reading from. But he, that's what we have to do sometimes. If we teach someone, well, they, well, what are you reading? What follows that? We have, may have to go further and let them know. Think it is the source of the, of power. Matthew twenty four. In forty four. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of God, for the Son of Man is coming. In the hour you, not, you do not expect. Give us unto, give us to give. It is too short. Acts 20 and 35. Acts 35b.
and I have for those who were with me. I have, I have assured, I have shown you everything, every way, by living life that you must support the work. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that said, it is more blessed to give than receive. We must work. It is the place of success. We work for the Lord, and it's always successful. Second Thessalonians two seventeen. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, good world of work. Whether it's for the Lord or whether it's for our job, we must do a good job and that will teach others, even in the workplace, that may be new. Now, if you've not obeyed Christ, well, Ask that you come tonight and obey the word that he is for us. And Just a moment, we'll sing the first verse and be dismissed. Appreciate that, David. I know you've done some studying there. Always great to hear God's Word preached to us. First verse, 496. <clears throat> this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't
can't get at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know heaven frame like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world